site straight away, you realise you've got common values and common beliefs. And it was like that with Pastor Rod and Sue, with things of the spirit, the word of faith, grace, and, and the journey that's come along. So um, it's just easy to get on with that. We actually don't know them that well because, you know, we live in Auckland, they live in Tower it. But conferences we've met up, etc. But my wife did get to spend some good quality time with them last year in Singapore. She was part of the team that went to visit Joseph Prince's ministry and spent some time with, with Joseph and have a lunch and stuff like that. So she got to spend some quality shopping time <laughs> with Pastor Rod and Sue. And she said they had a great sense of humour. She really enjoyed herself. And so that was really cool. So um, I went the year before, 2013, to Singapore and did the whole New Creation Church experience. And I've got to say the atmosphere that, that I felt when I walked in here was so much like New Creation Church in Singapore. It's just like it's it's easy and uh, it's unforced. It's like nobody's trying to drive it. It's just like it's the grace of God, it's the Spirit of God. And I'm, I'm an atmosphere guy. How many atmosphere people out there? I just, I just love atmospheres. You know, I can really thrive in the right atmosphere and not so good in the wrong atmosphere. You know what I mean? <laughs> they have my bad days too. But when there's an atmosphere, I, I love that. And so... Um, so it's a privilege to be invited here to speak. We really don't know any of you too much, although I think we have met Doresh and Isha uh, before in Auckland. And it's great to meet Pastor Dan and Glennis and a couple I met there from Wakatani that have come and said they love this place and it's good. And there's going to be more people coming to this place, amen? Amen. It's great to have a new facility here and what God's done. So um, this morning, I'm, I'm going to go out on the edge a little bit. You know, sometimes when you minister, as you know, um, you have a clear word set before you and, uh, and you just go through it as the Spirit of God leads you. There's other times you don't have a clue. And there's other times when there's just so much happening on the inside, it's like, help me Jesus. <laughs> we'll get this thing out somehow. And so um, let's go out on the edge this morning. Is that all right with you? Amen. And so if we stumble and stutter, but that's fine. Ruth Heflin Ward said that's a sign that the Holy Ghost is trying to lead you somewhere. So we'll just go with the Holy Ghost. And I sent her at a Holy Ghost church, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, cleanse the lepers, come to church. And you know, truly the atmosphere is wide open in this place. And I believe if anybody's sick today, you know, the Lord can get you healed. Amen. We can see that healing manifest. By the way, we actually run a healing rooms um, in Onihanga, which is kind of central Auckland, as part of the healing rooms, you know, John G. Lake healing rooms movement around the world. There's now 55 healing rooms here in uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Wow. And so it's growing fast. And so three times a week we go up to the healing rooms and uh, our young boy helps us, Sam. We call him Sam the Prophet. Amen. He draws prophetic pictures for people God. and it really ministers to them. We often see tears roll down people's cheeks when they see the picture and realise um, just the significance of it. So that's a blessing. So, so if there's an opportunity to pray for the sick at the end, um, we can maybe do that. So, praise God. So, who, who stirred for revival? How many people have stirred for revival? I know revival is a word that's bandied around a lot, and some people think a, a series of meetings is a revival. And you know, I know in America they talk about let's have a revival. It means maybe we'll have meetings for six weeks. But you know, revival is still valid. Amen. God still wants to bring revival, and I really believe Romans five seventeen talks about the abundance of grace and I believe that's when we really get into revival when we start to walk in an abundance of his grace I, I love grace, how about you? Amen. how many people here probably like me where you've tried so hard to make it work and it just didn't work <laughs> until you found it was all by God's grace Amen. <laughs> and then just start to relax and rest and, uh, and just see what God wanted to do and so I believe he's taking us into a place of abundance of his grace and the gift of his righteousness so we can truly reign in life. Mm. And I believe New Zealand is lined up for a great revival. <laughs> Amen. In fact, as a word of faith, grace person, I like to say revival is now. Yes. God never told us not to have revival. Mm. So we might as well just have revival. We might as well just be awakened. Amen. Yes. And uh, you know, the Spirit of God is always ready to move. Smith Wigglesworth said, if the Spirit of God doesn't seem to be moving, he said, we move the Holy Spirit. Amen. Because he's always wanted to do something. Hallelujah. <laughs> Sometimes it's just a matter of the Spirit of God stirring us up or even ourselves stirring ourselves up in the Spirit of God on the inside and start to lay hold of those things of God again. Sometimes we just need an awakening in our hearts to realize how awesome our God is and what a great destiny 
and what a great plan and what a great future He holds for us. I know He's got a great future for this church. Amen. The day will come when there'll be people queuing up to get in the doors of this church. Amen. Because I know the Spirit of God is welcome here. I know that you want to do the works of Jesus and the greater works. Hallelujah. But let's just start with the works of Jesus. That'd be good, wouldn't it? <laughs> we can get on to the greater works later, but let's just do the works of Jesus. You know, there's only one condition on doing the works of Jesus. Anybody know what that condition is? There's only one. John 14, 12. He who believes. How many people have the ability to believe this morning? It's not hard, is it? I don't think the Bible's a hard book. He who believes in me will do the works that I have done in greater works than this. So all we have to do is believe in Jesus, not ourselves, but Jesus. We have to believe that the same spirit that was in Jesus and on Jesus is now in us and on us. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Somebody said the only time that healing is hard is when we think we have something to do with it. <laughs> We've learned that in the healing room. Sometimes you get those harder cases come along, you know, the cancers, and you, you start to feel a little bit under pressure, and then straight away you've got to catch yourself and say, God, it's not, I'm not looking to myself here. God, you're the, you're the miracle worker. Amen. You're the healer. You're the supplier. And, and when you enter that rest, then you know the miracle's going to happen. And it does. We see miracles happen. Praise God. So, now, the Lord um, gave me a word earlier this year, around about April, May, kind of like a prophetic word. And this was the word. He said, I'm releasing, no, he said, I'm shaking the foundations of injustice. And I'm releasing my people from the things that have held them back. So he said, I'm shaking the foundations of injustice. And I'm releasing my people from the things that have held them back. In other words, containment. I believe the containment's coming off the people of God. Amen. I believe God's in the process of setting you free to be the son and daughter of God that you're destined to be. I believe this is your hour of Holy Ghost power, Amen. where you can step into the things that God has laid out before you. But it was interesting, God took me to Acts 16, which many of you will know is about Paul and Silas in prison. Amen. And so, you know, talk about an injustice. They were put in prison for doing the right thing. Anybody felt that you'd been put into a hard place immediately after you did the right thing? <laughs> Found yourself in a, a place of pressure and containment, but God, I did what you told me to do. And Lord, it seems to have backfired a little bit on me. Why am I now in this hard place? I was stepping out into the things of the Spirit, going from glory to glory. You know, the heavens were opening up, and now I'm in a prison. Now all of a sudden it got hard. But what did Paul and Silas do? Did they complain to God, why me? Why has this happened? No, what did they do? See. See, they started to praise Him at the top of their lungs at their midnight hour. They started to praise God as the grace of God enabled them to do that. And all the prisoners heard them. And then it says at midnight there was a great earthquake. There was a shaking. And everybody's chains were loose and all the doors were open. Praise God. And so God is shaking the foundations of injustice. And He's releasing you from the doors of the prisons that have held you back. Is that good news? Amen. That's what God's doing in the South because He's a just God. See, some of you have wondered why you've been going through the things you've been going through. Now, God hasn't put you in a containment, but just by doing the right thing, you might have found yourself in a hard place. It might have looked like your vision was going in the opposite direction to you were. But God said, I'm about to change things around. God says, I've been proving you. I've been proving your faithfulness. And God says, I'm about to open this thing up. As we were talking before, this is about the manifest sons of God. This is about the sons and daughters of God stepping into their destiny. Because this move that's coming is going to take the whole body of Christ. Yes. It's not just the five-fold ministry anymore. Amen. That's an equipping ministry. But the anointing is for the body. Yes. To do the works of the ministry. Out in the marketplace. Out in the highways and the byways. That's where, that's where the river gets deeper out there. Amen? Yes. It's shallower at the throne, but it gets deeper as it goes out. Yes. Praise God. That's where the anointing is. Yes. Now, um, glory to God, there was another word um, the Lord gave to me from Genesis chapter 7. So let's, uh, let's head over there. Genesis chapter 7. I got this one, I think, in about July. Genesis 7 and verse 11. We all doing okay so far? Yep. 
Genesis 7.11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Yeah. And I felt the Spirit of God say that, that it's time for the fountains to be broken up. Mm. And that really refers to the individual believer, maybe even the heart of the believer, that God is starting to break things up and soften things up on the inside mm. so that the fountains can be released. Mm. How many know that God has chosen you to flow His power through? Yeah. You know, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. We know that scripture well, but sometimes life comes along, doesn't it? The enemy comes along and tries to shove a little bit of dirt into that well, or tries to sow a root of bitterness to try and make the water bitter. And sometimes we find, man, I'm not really flowing like I could really flow. But God wants to release those wells again. Amen? Amen. By His grace, God wants to release those wells so that the fountains will start to supply. And when those fountains start to supply, guess what? The windows of heaven open and that rain comes down from heaven and we're in revival. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So who wants the rivers to flow through them? Amen. Maybe we'll see some wells unstopped today. Amen. We'll see a greater measure of that water coming out. Um, we were just talking before about, you know, longevity, going the distance. And I found a real key to, to longevity, when I say that, I'm, only, I'm turning 50 in about a few weeks' time, but we have been in ministry for since oh, 1995 now, and we've been on missions since 1989, my wife and I, so we've been involved in ministry a long time, and I found one of the keys is just to keep drinking, <laughs> just keep drinking that new wine, man, it's, it's refreshing, I even like to drink when I'm preaching, <laughs> it's good, I've been told some people say, you know, you just got to pour everything out, and I said, no way. So you're not getting my well. You can have the overflow, but you're not getting my well. That's right. I'm not going to pour my well out on you. Amen. I'll pour out the overflow. Yeah. I like to just keep drinking all the time. Amen. I never want to be empty. That's right. Some people think you've got to get empty before you can get filled again. The Bible says no. Be being filled with the Spirit. Amen. It doesn't say anything about getting empty. No, you just stay topped up. If you can keep your well full, then you can overflow and be a blessing to others. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. So if we stop and have a drink, is that okay with you guys? Yeah. No <laughs> Why don't we just have a little drink now? Yeah. Why don't we have a big drink now? Yeah. So grab your bucket. Grab it. This is how I like to do it. Two hands. Grab that barrel. How many barrel drinkers have we got around here? Come on, some of you before you got saved know exactly what I'm talking about. Keep drinkers, barrel drinkers. You grab that barrel and you open your mouth and you just go, whoa. <laughs> oh God, that's good. <laughs> yes, Lord, we'll take some more of that. <laughs> whoa, thank you, Lord. <laughs> thank you for the Holy Ghost. Whoa. That makes you happy, doesn't it, the new wine? <laughs> How many believe that the church should be the happiest place on earth? Yes. <laughs> My God, if we have a sad church, there's really not much hope for the world, is there? <laughs> I know this is a happy church. You've got happy pastors. But yeah. it's just good. It's good to drink and be free, isn't it? Yes. You know, I think if we can't be free in church, we can't be free. Oh. We'll never get a corporate atmosphere like this anywhere else. So yes. if we can't be free right now and move yes. the things of God right now, how, how can we do it anywhere else? Yes. You know, sometimes people say, well, we'll just teach you all the theory here, and you go out and do the stuff. I, I disagree with that. Yes. I think we need to teach and demonstrate in the church, and then take that outside. Yes. Amen. Right. Amen. It's like in the home, you train your children up. You don't just give them theory, you live it out before them, yes. so they can live it out when they go out into their world. Amen. Amen. So one, one preacher said, he said, if you're going to teach for an hour, you better demonstrate for an hour. He said, if you're going to teach for half an hour, you better demonstrate for half an hour. Don't just make it theory. I mean, this is the gospel. This is the power of God unto oh, salvation. Yes, you know, we're talking about Jesus who went around doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. That's right. You know, if we're going to teach for half an hour, let's demonstrate for half an hour. Oh, yes. Let's see God move. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Right. Oh. Wow. Woo. Now, let's turn to um, Titus chapter 2. This was another word I got. I just want to release this this morning. Titus, that's down there, I think, Timothy kind of territory, isn't it? Timothy Titus. Was it before Timothy, Sam? Yes. After Timothy. Yeah. 
Titus, there it is, just before that little book, Philemon. Titus 2, uh, we'll read from verse 11, maybe through verse 15. And I believe this is where the grace of God is at, at the moment. Uh, Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. You want to say all men? All, all men. men. None's left out. The grace of God covers all. It's appeared to all men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, and let no one despise you. Well, I'm a guest here, so I'm not going to rebuke with all authority. I'll leave that to your pastors. <laughs> I'm here to encourage and build up. And you don't know me, so I'm not going to do any rebuking this morning. Anyway, the Word of God does that anyway, doesn't it? But I believe this is where the grace of God is operating for us at the moment. And the Spirit of God said to me, he said, David, after someone's born again, what is the first work of grace according to the Scripture? And I had to look at it. And I said, well, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Teaching us that denying... Oh, really? Nah. That denying word? <laughs> denying ungodliness and worldly lusts? We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. But then, in verse 14, it talks about the end result is that he would purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. See, I like to look at the end of the book, amen? Sometimes the word denial doesn't go down too well, but what about the end of the book? It says that we will be zealous for good works. How many want to be zealous for good works? How many want to go out and do the works of Jesus with a zeal that is literally consuming you? Jesus said, zeal for God has consumed me. You know, when the Holy Ghost just becomes so real that, that you know, we just feel like he's working through us and, and consuming us. And so, so in Titus there, there is a work of grace that actually causes us to deny things. I know this doesn't sound very exciting at this point, but there's another scripture I want to give you with that, and it's in Matthew 16. Matthew 16, right after that great scripture about on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. How many like that one? So Matthew 16, after Peter has his little session and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Matthew 16, 24. I like Peter. He was just out there, wasn't he? Not afraid to have a go. Probably lived full of regrets, but <laughs> he had a go. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know, it seemed for the longest time that I never saw that word desire there. All I saw was the word deny. And I never found that very exciting, you know. People say, well, you're going to deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. That means turn the TV off and no more worldly pleasures and not allowed to watch the rugby and the motor racing and all that kind of stuff. Just deny yourself. Don't have a life. <laughs> you know? How many have ever heard that kind of thinking, you know? Just got to deny yourself. But I never saw that word desire there. It says, if anybody desires to come after me. And that puts a whole new slant on it, doesn't it? In other words, it comes out, it's birthed out of a desire by the grace of God, man, I just want Jesus. I just want God. I just want whatever God wants. Man, God wants revival, so I want revival. I just want to be on fire for God. That's my desire. Now, these guys understood back in the day when Jesus said, come follow me, he wasn't just inviting them to a, a Bible college of theory. He was actually saying, if you come and follow me, you can become like me. Amen. And they knew that. They knew when a rabbi approached you that he wasn't saying, just come and sit at my feet and listen to my word. He was saying, come and be like me. If you follow me, you can be like me. And so, you know, I don't know about you, but I would have a desire very quickly. If Jesus walked by and said, if anyone follow me, I'd have a desire very quickly to, the opportunity to become like Jesus. 
How many know you become like those you hang around? Yes. That's right. Praise God. If you want to come into revival, you better find some people who are revived. Amen. Yeah, yeah. You better hang around some people who are a bit more on fire than you. Yeah. If you want to increase the fire in your life. And so really it turns this denial thing into a good thing. It's not a denial. It's not a law based. Thou shall not, thou shall not, thou shall not. No, it's the fact that your desire for Jesus is growing so strong that you find there's some things you don't want to do anymore. You find that there's some things that would actually get in the way of your destiny and your desire, and you just flat refuse to do them anymore because you find they're not helpful. Yeah. And I'm not talking about necessarily sinful things, just things that would hold you back from your call. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 I mean, I love sport, I love a bit of motorsport, but I know that too much motorsport can be a hindrance to me because I can end up spending more hours in front of the TV than in this thing, in this book, should I call it a thing, should I? You know what I mean? But when the desire grows strong, it's like, just find yourself spending hours. Hours in the Word of God, hours in prayer. We just go through a season right now, this last three months, where God has really stirred up desire in our hearts, especially for revival. And our pastor was preaching on desire. And I asked myself the question, I said, what is it that, that stirs my desire? And the answer came straight away, read a book on revival. Read a book on revival. I want to challenge you this morning. What is it that stirs your desire? What is it that you could go home and do this afternoon that would actually stir you back towards the things of God in a greater measure? Maybe it is a book. Maybe it's a tape. Maybe it's a message you heard 10 years ago that turned your world upside down. What is it that stirs your desire that could be the doorway into your personal revival? And so I started reading um, a book which I found on my bookshelf I didn't even know was there called Cry For Me Argentina. Anybody heard of the Great Argentina Revival? Cry for me Argentina by Dr. Miller, Dr. Edward Miller, who's now gone, to be home, gone home to be with the Lord, 2003. But in 1948, the Lord called him from America to Argentina. And uh, he'd been through revival as a, as a young child. He was brought up in revival. He remembers at five years old, spending the whole night in church, um, several days, even weeks in, in succession. Um, people would literally go to revival meetings and go straight to work after the revival. They'd stop back home to get changed and they'd go straight back to the revival meeting. That's what I mean when I say revival is about an abundance of grace. I mean, you can't do that in the natural. And in some cases, they literally went for weeks and months without sleep. They literally went to revival and then to work, to revival, to work, uh, up to three months at a time. And sometimes they grow a little bit weary, but they'll never be tired because the Holy Spirit was supernaturally sustainable. Now that's abundance of grace. Amen. Amen. That's available. If there's hunger, we can step into that. God will respond. You know, I heard somebody say recently, the first time you prayed for revival, that's when God heard your, your prayer. That's when he answered your prayer. Amen. And the water might be ankle deep at the moment, but it's getting deeper. How deep do you want to go? How far do you want to take this thing? Amen. God's in it. Yeah. God's in revival. Amen. He wants this thing to go all the way over our heads. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. I believe we're heading there. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. Miller, he was called to Argentina. He'd been through Amy Semple McPherson meetings and um, Charles Price meetings. This is back in 1920s and things like that. So he saw revival as a kid. And he went to Argentina thinking, man, this is going to be easy. We're just going to take this revival to Argentina. It's going to be great. It's going to explode. And he got to Argentina, pitched a tent, had some meetings, and nobody showed up. Not one song. Not one person. He said not even a young kid came to see if it was a service. He said it was that bad. He said they set up the stage and they, they praised God anyway, but they had this tent set up and not one person came. They put out flyers and leaflets, and nothing was happening because it was a pagan nation. Ava Peron was kind of in control through her husband at that stage, and she'd, she'd launched the the country into spiritism and stuff like that. And so it was very, very hard spiritually. But the Lord challenged him to pray. And so he, he started to pray. And God put him on a schedule to pray eight hours a day. He said, if a man can work eight hours a day, you can pray for eight hours a day. And he thought that was the worst thing he ever heard. And so he said it was absolute drudgery. You know, he said the most he'd ever prayed before was about 40 minutes. He said he went on a, one of those prayer chains for an hour. He said he couldn't even last the hour. He said he prayed for 20 minutes and ran out. So he prayed the same thing again for 20 <laughs> minutes. 
And so 40 minutes, he said, well, there's no point praying it again. If God didn't hear it the first two times, he's not going to hear it the third time. And so he never prayed that long before. So through, he called it drudgery. He just prayed and made himself pray and, and, and studied the word. And, and he did that for eight weeks. And then on the eighth week, Friday afternoon, God came. God came and, and, and it just completely blew him away. He said it was like a river of gold fire. He said he felt like he was just floating and swimming in this river. And he said he just swam in that river for the next 10 weeks. He said it went just like that. He said the time just went. How many know sometimes you go to prayer and it seems hard? It should be glorious, but it just seems hard. It just seems like drudgery. It just seems like sometimes going through the motions, praying in tongues, you know that first five minutes seems to be the hardest, doesn't it? You think, God, what's the deal here? I'm starting to pray. The heavens are supposed to open, aren't they? Yeah, it, thinks, it seems like things get harder sometimes. But you know, people have to press through. Sometimes we have to press through that veil of flesh, amen, and find out what's really on the inside of us. Find out if there really is a desire for this thing. And I believe by the grace of God, we can have a desire that will take us into areas we haven't been before. So after this 10 weeks, um, he, said, he said, God, whatever you want to do, that's okay with me. Whatever you want to do, that's okay with me. And God said, I want to bless your church. Now, he had eight members in his church. He had inherited this church from a missionary, had been there for about 50 years, and managed to achieve eight members in 50 years. It was hard going. I mean, this is great, what we've got here this morning, isn't it? They had eight members. It was hard work. God said, I want to bless your church. And, and God said, what I want you to do this Sunday is tell your church that Monday night, you're going to have a prayer meeting, and it's going to be from 8 to midnight. And if you come, you have to come for the whole four hours. And so I just want you to come and be in that prayer meeting. And he said, God, God, you don't understand. He said, I've been trying to get people to come to a prayer meeting the whole time I've been here and people haven't come. And now you're saying, come out from 8 to midnight? God, they're not going to come. God said, just tell them what I said. So he announced it. And to his surprise, Monday night, 8 o'clock, there was uh, four people there, I think it was, or five people, including himself. And all that they did was they just sat there in silent prayer until midnight. And, on, and as soon as the second hand hit midnight, he said, right, who's got something from God? And he was sure they were all going to have some revelations and revival was going to break open. And so he went around one by one and got something. No, nothing, no. I didn't think, no, nothing, no. And then he got to the last lady and she kind of hesitated and said, well, no, not really. And he kind of locked on to that. He thought, she's got something. And so he tried to get it out of her, and she said, well, she said, I'm a bit ashamed to say this, but I have this urge to go to the little table in the middle of the room and to bang on the table. She said, it's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And he said, well, get up and do it. She said, no, I ain't doing that. <laughs> no. So anyway, they met back the next night, Tuesday night, same thing, 8 o'clock to midnight, absolute silence. Got anything? No. Got anything? No. You still have that urge to bang on the table? Yep. Go and do it. No. And she just wouldn't do it. She wouldn't do it. So this went on the third night. Exactly the same thing happened. Anything? No. 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 Still got that urge? Yep. Get up and do it. No. She wasn't going to do it. The more, the more time went on, the more she wasn't going to do it. Anyway, so the fourth night, now that they're there, and he's kind of a little bit exasperated, like, come on, something's got to happen. And so I think at this stage he said they wait until 11 o'clock and he'd had enough. <laughs> he said, right, this is what we're going to do. He said, oh, at first he said, have you still got that urge to go and bang on the table? She said, yes, I have. Go and do it. No. Right, he said, this is what we're going to do. He said, we're all going to get up. We're all going to walk around the table and praise God and we're all going to hit the table. Amen. So they got up and they started praising God and one by one they started to thump the table and she wouldn't do it. <laughs> And she just, but they just led her to herself for a couple of minutes and she carried on praising God. Then all of a sudden, she walked over to that table and she banged on that table. And when she did, did so, all of heaven opened up. The Holy Ghost came into that room. They all got baptized in the Holy Ghost. There was one guy who was, ended up under the table praising God. They all got spirit filled. And there'd be nobody getting spirit filled for years. And so you can imagine what happened the next night. More and more people came. People started coming to the church. The church doubled in size and doubled in size again and doubled in size again. And that was actually the beginning of the great Argentina revival, which continues to this day. Carlos Anaconda is still ministering 
in stadiums and crusades to this day. That revival has not stopped since 1948. Isn't that something? So we're not talking about a revival that lasts three months here. We're talking about something that's gonna, gonna span. You know, this is gonna be this big move of God that has been promised by Smith Wigglesworth and others, the Word. Those with an emphasis on the Word, those with an emphasis on the Spirit finally coming together. <laughs> and we're gonna see this thing take off. I also read about the Hebrides revival, which encouraged me because the prayer, the time of prayer wasn't that long. Um, as often happens, people in churches kind of look around and think, well, there doesn't seem to be salvations like there could be, and there doesn't seem to be miracles like there could be. You know, perhaps we should just press in and pray a little bit and see what God will do. So in the Hebrides Islands, um, there were seven guys, I think it was, and two ladies, one of them was blind. The two ladies were sisters, I believe, and they prayed by themselves, but these seven guys said, let's meet in the old shed up the road about three times a week, and let's just pray, and let's see God do something in this place. They were convinced that God would bring revival if they prayed. And I like that attitude, amen? How many are convinced that if we just pray for revival, God will respond amen. with a great move? That's and so three times a week they met, and they found that they ended up praying up to 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning. So they might start 7 p.m. And they ended up just praying all through the night and, um, and travailing and groaning for souls. I believe that's coming back to the church. Some of you probably already do that. And so, but it was only a period of five months when the heavens opened and the revival hit the Hebrides Islands. And just mass revival. It was just amazing the things that happened. People just knew there was something in the air. Even at midnight, lights would just flick on on the houses at midnight. And people would go to the church. Nobody had told them. Nobody had knocked on the door. They just knew something had changed in the heavenlies. And they responded to it. Even people out on fishing boats were, were, were weeping with conviction. And so just five months, three times a week, revival broke out. It's not, it can't be that hard, can it? Why? Because God's in it. God wants to do it. And so we've just been getting so inspired. Ended up reading about four or five books on revival. Reading Charles Finney. Charles Finney said, man, you can have revival whenever you want it. He was a great revivalist, was criticized that he was mechanical, but he said, if you do this, this, and this, you can have revival because God's in it. Amen. And so um, we, we got so stirred up that we found that um, we would get up at all different hours of the night. We'd get up maybe 11 o'clock, get out of bed, or 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, just because we wanted to, just because there was such a desire there for God and for revival, and we find we'd get up maybe two or three hours and pray and go back to sleep or sometimes not, you know, just get up at three and just pray right through. And somehow God would sustain us during the day. And it's like this fire and this hunger has just been growing on the inside. And it's like you, it comes to a stage you can't contain it anymore. And so what are you going to preach on this morning? Revival! It's like, man, there's a, there's a fire that gets in your bones. And Amen. you go to pray and it's like a volcano erupting on the inside. And it's Amen. not you trying to do it. It's like you just can't help it anymore. It's like the Spirit of God on the inside, you know. It's like Jeremiah said, there's a fire shut up in my bones and I cannot hold it in. You know, when you look in the eyes of Jesus, what do you see? You see a flaming fire. The, the eye is the window of the soul. The reason you see fire in his eyes is because there's a fire in his soul. There's a fire in his being. There's a passion inside of him for people. Hallelujah. And who lives on the inside of us? We heard this morning. Christ in us. The hope of glory. See, it's not really about us. We should have learnt that by now. <laughs> Years of trying. God, it's, I just like Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. See, I believe that Jesus Christ is the spirit of revival. Amen. He is the spirit of revival. Right. He's on the inside of us. And he is the fire that's on the inside of us. He's the one that does the works and the greater works through us. So all we got to do is get out of the way. That's right. All we got to do is let him pray through us. Let the spirit of God have his way through us. And I'll tell you what, you start to get addicted to it. I was talking to a friend yesterday. He came down to the mountain. Pastor friends from Wakatani. And he was telling me when he started Edgecombe Christian Fellowship, Pastor Greg and Judy King, down there. He said he didn't know what to do. And he said, he said he just started to pray. And he said sometimes he'd find himself praying for 12 hours. He'd just pray in the, in the building they've got down there. He'd pray in there. 
and the church door would be open and he'd be praying in his office and he found out later that people were actually coming in to the auditorium and, and falling out under the power. He didn't even know until later on when he was told. He, would just, he just got addicted to prayer and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and the Spirit of God began to move in that place. And they've seen all kinds of healings, miracles and signs and wonders happen. But he said it's been hell at the same time. <laughs> And that's the journey. And see, some of you have come up against that. You've started out and you've, you've headed that direction and it's like all of hell comes against you. But you know what? You just dig deeper into the grace of God. And you find out that there's somebody in, on the inside of you who's not going to quit. Who's not going to let you down. And you just tap into that grace again. That's right. You know, you, you praise them again. You know, that's why atmosphere is so important. That's right. Because there's, there's like an atmosphere today. There's refreshing in this place, from, from the effects, from the heat, and from the pressure. We were just talking before, just being honest with each other, that there's, there's been like a lot of pressure this last month or two or three. And it's like, you know, it's just, it's just been there. And it's like, you kind of know it's that kind of pressure that, that, that's about to blow open and this thing's going to gonna, gonna unfold itself. You know? God. It's like, man, if you didn't believe that, well, why would you even bother? <laughs> it's kind of like that, isn't it? But I tell you, now's the time to let desire rise up on the inside. I believe the title of this message could be Awakening Desire. Amen. I believe God wants to stir and awaken a desire on the inside of us. Hallelujah. Just keeping an eye on the clock there. What time did we launch out? It's about 10 to? Somewhere around there. Okay. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> How many are getting a little bit stirred up this morning? Amen. Man. How many want to just get out there and do the stuff? Come on. How, many, how many want to just see more of the stuff happen in the house? And man, you've got a great house here. I can, I can feel the atmosphere here. There's, there's no restrictions in this house. And I mean that. Sometimes you go to a place and there are religious, political spirits. And man, they put a ceiling on the atmosphere. And you can just feel that the atmosphere is not free. But there is a freedom in this house. And I'm not just saying that. There is a freedom. Mm -hmm. In this house, there is a grace in this house that I believe is going to go from grace to grace to grace. And it's going to be easy for people to step in to the things of God and to, to be the manifest sons of God. Amen. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Why don't we just stand?